When the Dallas Cowboys Stadium and the Kauffman Center were built, there was an empty plot of land to build on. Dropping Barclays Center into the middle of Brooklyn, New York, was an entirely different story. With such a large building, people were anxious about the new arena. How would it fit into the neighborhood? Surely it would bring a lot more traffic and congestion. And would the community embrace their new team, the Brooklyn Nets? It seems to have done that and a lot more. So how did Barclays Center become the hottest ticket in town? such a big building and such a busy place. Now, traffic must have been a big issue. No, it, 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 you know, it, it was a huge concern. But what's been amazing is really this, this design privileges mass transit. We're located at the central hub where you have nine subway lines, Long Island Railroad, all converging at this point. So basically, the majority of people come here using mass transit. And this is what they come into, this incredible civic gesture, and the idea of, of the arms reaching out, the front porch. You couldn't ask for a better moment. The inside entrance and main concourse embody the energy of the public plaza. From here, visitors can see directly into and through the arena. This was not supposed to be an arena with concrete floors, even if it had been beautifully designed. The idea was to make it completely different, more like a theater than an arena or stadium. We're in an urban area, it's a little bit different. Why not feel like you're part of where you are? Instead, there's a tendency to build the public stadiums, arenas, in a way that they're unto themselves. That's just wrong. You want to have the sense of urban cars going by. There's something almost athletic about the building exterior. With its fluid, muscular forms, it's an apt expression of the players inside. Pretty dense city. So where where in Brooklyn was this built? Well, it's uh, it's really interesting. It's it's right in the middle of five established neighborhoods, but it was over a train yard, and it was right where two major boulevards cross at Atlantic Avenue and Flatbush Avenue in downtown Brooklyn. Putting a new arena in Brooklyn was an exciting opportunity, but the small size of the lot and its awkward triangular configuration presented a real challenge. Two firms worked together on the site. Shop was the design architect. Acom, with its wealth of experience in sports architecture, was the architect of record. Initially, Acom test fit the site and set up some of the organizing principles. Court here, seating in a concourse that rings the court, a small service area to the back, and the main entry right here. Shop architects entered the picture and worked very hard to find other opportunities. The triangle was transformed into a grand entry plaza. A spectacular canopy overhead, what they call the Oculus. And the sides of the building were so tight against the streets, it made you wonder how this might work. What Shop did was make the sides transparent. For example, the retail shop here, so that people passing by can look directly into the arena and feel connected to the activities on the inside. It's not like this was the first time Brooklyn had its own professional sports team. The last time that Brooklyn Dodgers played here was 1957. In fact, the flagpole out in front is the original one from Ebbets Field. It marks a spot where the Dodgers wanted to build a new stadium before making their move. So even when we're in the field, we can actually When still... Shop was invited to design the new arena, they employed the most cutting edge design tools and software. Their use of technology starts with some old school inspiration. We grew up building models, and we're just passionate about aviation. And what's interesting is a lot of the technology we use here comes from the aerospace industry. So there's, there's definitely a direct connection there. The other thing about this is that they're all, there's like hundreds of planes up here. They're all different shapes and sizes with different performance envelopes, but they all can fly. And in a way, we, we look at buildings the same way. 
Using advanced computer-rated software, Shop's work pushes the boundaries of form, space, and building technology. So we said, why couldn't we use some of that same knowledge and bring it into the world of architecture? In a way, we see architecture the same way. No one building, no one client is the same, and understanding how you design to a very specific problem. And it was a super complex uh, shape, so we made literally hundreds of models that showed how we did the different um, uh, uh, forms and dimensions and shapes. You know, should it be stone? Should it be stainless steel? You know, should it be painted metal of color? And, and we really thought about the sort of you know, post-industrial Brooklyn heritage. Like, what makes Brooklyn authentic? What makes it cool? It's got this kind of grit to it. It's a triangle. We don't normally work with footprints that are triangles. Anytime you're working in Brooklyn, in New York City, the urban setting, um, just the whole construction site is a big challenge. ACOM, a firm with a lot of experience designing arenas, served as sports architect and architect of record for this venue, using their knowledge to collaborate with SHOP. You have 12,000 panels, 940 mega panels. Technology is the only way to help manage this level of complexity. And so what we do is we do a, a point cloud scan of the actual steel and layer that onto the digital model to see if those clips are in the right place. If any of the clips are off, we just recut them off and reposition them so that they're exactly the right place, and then the panels go up seamlessly. When most buildings are new, they look great, but it all goes downhill from there. The building gets dirty, it deteriorates, but not here. The steel skin will only look better with time. So we created a model in the computer where we were able to look at the entire building and actually change the percentages of the open and closed pieces of steel and actually watch the budget numbers change, maintain the overall look of the building, but yet hit the number that we needed to actually get it built. Well, fantastic. Client must love that. They did, and, and we got all the architecture we wanted. So we wanted something raw and industrial, something that would patina and age gracefully. We didn't want it shiny and painted. And what we did was we cut the 12,000 different shaped pieces of steel and hung them on a dry cleaner rack where they went through 15 wet dry cycles a day using water we collected from the roof for four months. And at the end of that four months, they have basically 10 years of rust patina on them. It won't age uh, for the next 40 or 50 years and gives you this kind of beautiful, rough, leathery, almost snakeskin look that we think is really kind of fantastic. No two of the 12,000 panels are the same and every single one floats out and then folds and makes these sort of shadow boxes so that when the light hits it, you get all these different patterns. One of the most impressive structures is the oculus, a huge freestanding canopy. How do you build something like this so it hangs in midair? That's where the structural engineer comes in. All this entry plaza is a gigantic space. How do they create the structure for it? So we could span that distance over the plaza with a beam, which is something like this, where we could support it either end, and our arms would be acting like columns. But let's say in this scenario, you're the building or the arena, and then this is the entry plaza, and people are coming from this direction. I don't want this column in the way. How do we, how do we get rid of it? Sure. So in terms of the change we could make at the building end, I could move my arms around in the way we support the structure. And if I do something like this, you can now remove your arm away. Right now we have the structure hanging out into the space because of the way we've supported it back at the building. And this is called a cantilever. Now in this building, what happens is this cantilever sweeps around and ties back over here like this. So that's a double cantilever? It is, cantilever at either end, but it does something else as well. Both cantilevers now act in torsion. And what do you mean by torsion? Torsion is twist. And something that's good at carrying twist or torsion is a tubular shape, which is continuous. So much like this, where you have a tube shape around the perimeter. And you can't see this, that's in, it's buried inside the facade of the structure itself. But if I hold this end and you try twisting it, see, it's very hard to twist. But if I take the same shape and I put a slot in it here, then if I hold it the same way, you try twisting again. And this is analogous to a beam and twisting. This is very bad. This is a bad thing, exactly. So in the case of the Barclays Center, what they've got is the two cantilevers reaching out either end, like my arms, to support this area outside the plaza. They're acting as cantilevers for my shoulder, and they're also taking torsion to represent that space. 
What also makes Barclays Center different is the transparency. Their street-level retail space, which is unusual for an arena, this public interface invites the community to look inside and share a sense of ownership in the center. So this is the practice court, and we're one level below grade here. And what's unusual about it is the transparency from all of the public spaces. So there's this constant inside-outside connection. So if you look up here, you can see right out to the public street, people walking on the streets of Brooklyn can look into the, into the practice court. You have the VIP entry on this side. Um, right above here, it actually opens up into one of the restaurants in the bowl itself. Here, it connects to the courtside club so that people could have events. Not only could they practice, the teams practice here, but you could have corporate events or parties in this location. On this side, it looks up into the main entry of the building. And if you look here, it goes right through a public restaurant and you can see out to the Oculus and the main public space in front of the building. We thought of sports as theater with an unscripted ending. And so that was our inspiration, was to make this feel like black box theater. Oh, <laughs> to have this super dark bowl with the black seats and the dark gray concrete and the blackened steel, and, and then make the court pop so that the performers, whether they're the athletes or at a concert or an event, really almost float magically in the middle of the space. And what's really unique is that you can really see now the street. That's where the street is, right? So what people can actually see inside the arena. Exactly. As part of this whole inside-outside urban arena idea, we wanted the architecture to be really inviting. So for when you're in the public space, you can actually see right into the bowl. You can see the scoreboard before you've even given your ticket from, in. From that plaza under the Oculus, you can really begin to see inside. Exactly. The concourse that rings the arena is filled only with Brooklyn-based vendors that were hand-picked. So as you come into the main concourse, you can pretty much see directly out, right onto the Brooklyn Street. And the court is right there. The court is right there. Director of Interiors at SHOP, Krista Ninavaji, made sure that arena amenities were just as progressive as the exteriors. So it doesn't feel just like a sports arena with all of these beer companies and all these sponsors exactly. kind of all over the place. It doesn't feel like that at all. We were striving very hard to kind of mute down a lot of that. That's kind of where a lot of the idea for the Black Box Theater came from. So there's reclaimed woods, there's skateboard ramp materials for a lot of the tabletops. A lot of the furniture is made out of bar stock steel. There's raw concrete. And we were just able to kind of combine them in a way that was very clean. And so it felt luxurious and not messy. The club called The Vault may be the most exclusive destination with 13 individual suites that radiate out from a glittering champagne bar. The singer of Jay-Z is part of this space, right? Yes, Jay-Z definitely had a lot of input into this space in particular. It was kind of every time we showed him a rendering, it was sort of make it more gold, make it more gold. So we had a lot of fun with that. With Barclays Center on such a small and congested site, there was no space for parking or a loading dock. The solution was to put in large elevators and a turnstile, like a lazy Susan, that spins trucks and buses around and sends them in the right direction underground. Like the premium clubs and dining areas upstairs, the Brooklyn Nets got their own premium spaces too. Barclays Center is the crown jewel of a much larger development called Atlantic Yards. It's a massive 22-acre mixed-use commercial and residential development consisting of 14 towers. The first tower to be built was designed by SHOP. How tall will that be? That'll be 32 stories tall. And what's fascinating about B2 is it will be the tallest modularly constructed building in the world. And what do you mean by modular? What that means is that the actual apartments are built in a factory, like the way you would build a car, and then shipped and stacked 32 stories tall. What's the advantage of doing that? Multiple. Um, one, the quality level is much higher. Just like not building something in the, in the field, you're building it in a controlled factory environment. That's better. It also has less impact on the neighbors as you build it because you cut the construction time almost in half. Everything is completed from the bathrooms, the kitchens, the lighting, the flooring, the switch plates. It sounds fantastic, but now the problem is you're going to block your beautiful building. How do, what do, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, you always have mixed feelings, but at least we're blocking our own building. <laughs>
How far does it go down? All the way where that crane is. To that where that crane is, exactly. And Twelve big developments. Boom, 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 boom. The Atlantic Yards development extends well beyond the footprint of Barclays Center. And this is the location where 12 more residential towers are going to go in the future. And these will be okay. right, right in here. And these will be uh, mixed income, market rate, uh, lots of public open space, really uh, about 6 million square feet of housing. And your building is really right at that intersection of all of these different uh, transportation lines. Exactly. So the, the arena is the heart of the development, but then really the majority of it is about housing and retail that goes around it. Because the building site in Brooklyn was so much smaller than the typical arena, it had to be creatively squeezed in. This is most apparent in the raked seating on the upper levels. The slope was made as steep as possible to save every bit of space, specifically 14 feet on the sides. From a fan experience perspective, the seats are closer, creates uh, you know more volume from a sound perspective, gets louder in here, that helps the home team. Because the volume is tighter. Yeah, the, you know, it's more vertical, so it's going down instead of up, like you know, in some baseball stadiums. because right now the biggest challenge we have in the entertainment industry is getting people out of their homes where they have huge theater rooms. We need to create a fan experience that is so awesome that they want to leave their house to come and, and to get that experience. So when you first conceived of this, of this place, did you ever think it would be su become such a destination? Well, the answer is we did an enormous amount of work ahead of time to try and make it that. I always say it's like a Broadway show. You don't know till you open the door. So we opened the door and guess what? We were so happy and I have to say, even I, even we did not think it would become so significant. Uh, am I happy with it all? I sometimes go like this. Um, I pinch myself and say, wait a minute, did this really happen to me that I was part of? It's about people and if people are happy and they enjoy this place, I'm happy. Visit coolspaces.tv to order the four-part DVD and the Cool Spaces Companion Book.